It's that time of year again when all the wine publications are coming out with their top 100 wines of the year. And now we're moving on to a very divisive figure in the wine industry, James Suckling. I'm here with Jacques Guigano, the owner of La Fleur. I'm here with Paul Ponte, the managing director of Chateau Margaux. I'm here with Bill Harlan at Harlan Estates. In wine writing, there's only a handful of figures that actually matter and are actually making big bucks, and I think that he's one of them. And I think that's what causes a lot of envy. But honestly, I just think that a lot of people are kind of jealous of his lifestyle. I mean, there's a lot to be jealous of. He drinks great wine, hangs out with all these famous owners, traveling all around the world. It looks like a cool lifestyle. Fact of the matter is, he did work at Wine Spectator for almost 30 years. That's a heck of a lot of experience that's putting your time in. And he gets made fun of a lot of times because his scores are a bit on the high side. The bomb. I'm 99 points. A lot of people actually wonder about, you know, some of his practices in terms of scoring wines because the wines get scored so high. But I have to tell you a couple of stories from friends that I know personally. The first story is of my friends who own a small importing company. In the U.S., the importing distribution businesses are really dominated by the big boys. So my friends own like a small boutique import business and they needed their wine scored. And you know what? They reached out. James Suckling said yes. They dropped off the wines. They got the score and it positively affected their sales. And then next I knew was a small producer in a real lesser known country. His wines were getting imported into America. However, the importer would not take wines without critic scores. And you know what? James Suckling did score them. So he was able to sell some of his wine in the US. I actually met James Suckling in person once. I don't think he would remember me. It was in Hong Kong at one of his tasting events. His tasting events are incredible events if you get the chance to go. I haven't looked at the list yet. This is the first time. Let's take a look. Okay, we're gonna start at the bottom and work our way up. All right, some already some big names. I already see some Australians, some Chilean wines. James Suckling's lists every year are more well-established, like well-pedigreed producers. If you wanna find value, cause these are all really fine wines, I would just say pick the producer, go find their entry-level wines and you're gonna be okay. Let's go to number 100, the Heinschke Shiraz Eden Valley Hill of Grace Vineyard 2017. I only put that in because that wine's on my wish list. I've had a lot of the great Australian red wines. I have not had this wine for some reason. 99 points he gave. I'm again, pretty high score. Big, big, big time wine. If you've had it, drop it in the comments below. I haven't had it yet. Okay, let's go to number 95 and 94. Ooh, excited. The Gut Hermannsburg Riesling Cooper Groove uh, Grosses Gewachs Reserve Riesling 2017. I actually got sent this Riesling a couple years ago. I think it's extraordinary. Uh, Gut Hermannsburg used to be the cooperative in Naha. A private, uh, private person came and taken over. Outstanding Riesling. Naha's my favorite region in Germany for dry Rieslings. This is rich. It has depth. Whoa, 90. 94, 93, excellent. You know, a lot of you were complaining about Riesling, not like your Schaefer Frolic Riesling, the Naha Felsenek, the Grosses Gewax, and then the Sean Labor Riesling Naha Halenburg Grosses Gewax 2021. I've been to both of these estates before. These are outstanding Rieslings, outstanding producers. Uh, Schaefer Frolic, a lesser known. Emmerich Sean Labor is, is, I think, a little bit more well known. Now, here's the thing though uh, Emmerich Sean Labor is in the village of Monzinger, I think that's the name of it. There's a couple of small producers there that don't have the cachet, the names, but since they have some of the same vineyards and they share the same village, it's like this little haven tucked away in the Naha, the wines can be just as good. Guys, honestly, a lot of these German Rieslings on the list are Grosses Gewax Grand Cru wines. I would just go for that producer and then go for the Orch wine, which is the village wine, or the Erstelaga, which is the premier crew. You're gonna get a lot more value for money. Aha, all right, number 80, the Foradori Taraldago Vigna del Lomati from Granata 2019. This is from Trentino. On the bottom half of Trentino, Alto Adage, Elisabetta Foradori, pretty famous in the minimal invention wine world. Teraldigo is such a unique red grape from that area. I think forest berry type flavors. She also makes a couple of wines in Amphora, some, some wines with skin contact. I think this is an excellent wine. We move up to 79 and 78. Let's put these together. The Schlosskut Dio Riesling Nahe Bergberg, Grisses Gewax 2020. Outstanding. Been to the state, a super old estate. Uh, Carolyn, the daughter, is kind of taking over the winemaking there. She's doing an, a fantastic job. You'll actually see 
one of their collaboration Rieslings with a Washington State producer in an upcoming video. The Thorley Riesling from the Rheinhessen, also just outstanding. The Ol, the Ol Trocken, I've been to that site before. I think it's up in the north. It's up in the, let me get my directions right, up in the northwest part of Rheinhessen. It's right across the river from the Naha. Great site for Rieslings. Those Rieslings are so bright, so, of, so full of fruit, pineapple, uh, lemon type flavors. You know, those of you that are were against, you know, <laughs> wine spectators not having Rieslings, look at this. Lots of Rieslings here. Number 76, the Paul Hobbs Cabernet Sauvignon, the Beckstoffer uh, Tau Cologne Vineyard. Expensive wine, pedigree wine producer, one of the best vineyards in Napa. Outstanding wine. It's not cheap, but this is like outstanding Napa Cab. 72, I haven't had this vintage, but this is one of my favorite, most memorable wines in the world, the Chateau Chevaubon from saint Emilion. Now look, I know it's a, re I mean, it's ridiculously priced. I don't even know what that wine goes for. It's gotta be, I think it's $1,200 on release, kind of ridiculous price, but it's an outstanding wine. Uh, saint Emilion, though, I think that you can get some really, really good value from money wines. I have a couple videos coming up with some saint Emilion Grand Cru red wines I think are worth checking out. Wow, Riesling heads, okay. Okay, number 66, a Wittmann Riesling, the Rheinhessen, the Mornstein. I've also been there, sat down with a, with Philip Wittmann, the Mornstein. I've had the, the Grosses Gewax Mornstein 2018 and 19. Some of the most memorable dry Rieslings I've ever had in my life. Incredible wines. If you just buy his standard Trocken Riesling, I think it's outstanding. I think you can find it around the world for 20, 25 bucks. He also makes a basic Spate Burgunder, like Pinot Noir, that's I think is really good too. Uh, number 64, a wine that you might see soon on this channel. Isley Vineyard Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley. Kind of ridiculous, one of those cult Cabernets. I think Chateau Latour bought it. Number 61, Schaefer Vineyards Cabernet Sauvignon Hillside Select. To me, this is maybe my favorite Napa Cabernet Sauvignon. It's got so much elegance. It's rare, it's expensive. I think it's three, $400. You know, if you wanna get something less expensive from them, I think their TD9 is a Bordeaux blend. I think that's like a $60 wine, really, really good wine. Their Relentless Syrah is like 90, and I know that's expensive, but it's an outstanding wine. A Napa Valley Syrah, Mwah. The Chateau Pichon Longueville Baron Pouillac 2019. I was just in on Premier Bordeaux, had this wine. Again, extraordinary wine, not cheap though. Uh, I have to say though, they have some inexpensive wines because they have a couple of properties. And if I can remember them, I'll put it up on the screen. I think they're worth checking out. They had this one, I think that was 50 bucks. I think it was really good value for money. Okay, number 59, the Atarangi uh, Pinot Noir from Martinboro. Central Otago gets all the press for Pinot Noir. I, I like the Pinot Noirs from Martinboro a lot, right on the south tip of the North Island. I remember being at a humongous New Zealand Australian Pinot Noir tasting in Hong Kong a few years ago. And although this is a big brand, and it's an expensive wine. This wine really stood out to me a lot. I think it's an excellent wine. Another iconic wine that's super expensive, the Ridge Vineyards Montebello 2019. To me, one of the greatest wines in the world, Bordeaux blend. And I know this wine's generally more expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars. However, Ridge, I think when you go for some of their uh, Zinfandel blends, the most famous is Geyserville. But for me, I prefer the lower priced ones, the Litton Springs, and then the Three Valleys. I think those are outstanding wines. You get some of the house style. Those wines, I think, are in the 25 to to $35, $40 range worth checking out. Number 44, the Grosset Riesling Clare Valley Polish Hill. Uh, I don't know what level this is in their portfolio. Amazing Rieslings coming out of Clare Valley in Australia. Excellent producer. Even if you get their base Riesling, I think you're gonna be very, very, very happy. And this wine is available in the US, I know that for sure. Okay, number 43, the Cune Rioja Imperial Gran Reserva. Uh, you know, it can be a little bit more pricey. Cune is a well-distributed brand. If you just get the Reserva, you're gonna save yourself a lot of money and it's gonna be pretty good. These are a lot of big names. You know, I, I think, uh, I'm not in his pocketbook, I don't work for him, but I know that a lot of these, I know a lot of these producers show up at some of his events and I, I do know what the events cost because I have friends that are producers that have visited. So that's probably why you see up on the list, like number 40 is the Chateau Costa d'Estournel, Saint Estef 2019, just had this at Home Premier. Awesome wine, really bigger style, a super second growth. You know, not in everybody's budget. <laughs> oh, number 34, the Lustau Jerez Amontillado Vors, 30 years old. 
Amontillado are just these nutty sherries aged under the floor, which is basically a thin film of yeast, give off these real nutty almond flavors, and they are extraordinary. And Lustau is a big house. You'll find them all over the place. Okay, you don't have to get this. I can't, I don't, this probably was more of a premium wine, but their base, uh, Amontillado, is outstanding. They actually have one of the more affordable Polo Cortados that I've ever seen, and Polo Cortado is one of the rarest types of sherries. Not everybody can take that fortified style, that nutty style. I personally love it. It's worth checking out. Number 33, my favorite prestige champagne ever, the Tetinger Champagne Comte de Champagne Blanc de Blancs 2012. They make two Comte de Tetinger. They make a rosé, which is rare, and the Blanc de Blancs was just at the estate last year. Extraordinary wine i like the philosophy it's not cheap you know a couple hundred bucks but it's not it's not out of control like some of these other champagnes and the, their philosophy is they really want to make the champagne expensive but affordable enough that, that almost everybody can purchase one or try it at one time so I, I think it's worth checking out not too many surprise values like i saw on the wine spectator top 100 list and i'm trying to give cheaper alternatives to some of these wines just you have to cut me a little bit of a break because I'm looking at this for the first time and sometimes it's hard to think on the fly. I get to pull it out of thin air what's up here in the head. Number 28, the Lucha Dele, Dele Vite, Toscana Luce. <laughs> That wine, I, I've just never been excited about that wine. I don't know, maybe some guys you... Um, number 21, the Catina Zapata Chardonnay Mendoza Adriana Vineyard White Bones 2020. Outstanding Chardonnay. It's more expensive. If you want something a little bit more affordable, they have their Historic Rose, which is about 35 bucks in the U.S. You can find it. It's an outstanding Chardonnay. I would, that's worth checking out. 18, the FX Piesler Riesling from Rojao, the Tachrid, which is the vineyard. Steinertal. FX Piesler, outstanding wines from Austria. Riesling had, I prefer German Rieslings, FX Piesler, you know, it's one of those Aust iconic Australian Rieslings I really like, make good Gruner Veltliner, especially at their base level too, worth checking out. Oh, <laughs> number 15, the Donhof Riesling, the Nahe Niederhauser Hermann Schrolle Spätlese 2021. This is, again, from the Naha, one of my favorite producers of Naha in my favorite region. This is a sweet Riesling, a Spätlese from a great vineyard, the Hermann Schorle. This is a little more expensive, but outstanding. Also, if you just get the base Donhof Riesling, you're gonna be very happy. And I think I've seen that for about 27 bucks in the US. The Paolo Scavino Borolo, number 14, the Paolo Scavino Borolo Rocchi del Annunziata <laughs> Riserva 2016. Had this before, gave it 100 points. Even the Polo Scavino, the base level Barolo, I think is outstanding. I think, I, I, I can't remember what, what vineyard if the, if the commune is in uh, Castiglione de Filetto. We're chicken, and 2016 Barolos and Barbarescos, they drink so well now, I think. They're gonna age really well, but really good. Oh, nice. Number 13. These type of wines you don't see on other publications. The Cumia River Chardonnay, the Cumia Mate Vineyard, 2021. Cumia River, one of the iconic producers in New Zealand. I haven't had this vintage, but this is an extraordinary Chardonnay. I know that New Zealand's known for Sauvignon Blanc. I have one in the glass right now, actually. Extraordinary Chardonnay worth checking out. Okay, let's move into the top 10 here. <laughs> I mean, look. So you guys complaining in the comments, Riesling heads in on a four year sling. Number seven, the uh, Emmerich Knoll Riesling, the Wachau Reed Leuenberg. Schmarag. Schmarag is basically a ripeness level. 2021, outstanding producer, outstanding Riesling. However, the Reed Leubenberg, you can find other producers that make Rieslings from that vineyard that are going to cost a lot less money. Make sure to write that down. That's an outstanding, outstanding wine. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Number five, the K Vintners Grenache, Valla Valla Valley, The Boy, 2019, from Washington State. Washington State, real famous for their GSMs their Cabernets, their Merlots. This pretty iconic producer. Again, not a cheap wine. He makes a couple of really interesting um, brands that are less expensive. I know he just sold that brand, but like one of the famous is the Kung Fu Girl Riesling. Uh, I think the Boom Boom uh, Syrah. I think these wine, those wines are like 13 to 20 bucks if you want to kind of get the house style. Number four is Chateau smith hole Lafitte Passat Leonion, one of my favorite areas in the world for Bordeaux. They have the red here. I think the smith hole Lafitte Blanc, the white wine, is their best wine. And you know, those wines are expensive, but if you want to go down and you want to get their Petite 
Ho Lafitte, I think that's that's like their second one. Those are more affordable. Wow, number two, the Kunstler Riesling Rheingau Hohl uh, GG Riesling 2021. I've been to estate. Um, their Rieslings, Kunstler, I actually prefer their Pinot Noirs to their Riesling. So not bad, not ridiculously priced. And before we get to the number one wine in his list, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell so you know when new videos come out. If you like videos like this, leave a comment below. It's one of my favorite things about these reaction videos is interacting with you in the comments. Okay, number one, the BV Cabernet Sauvignon, George de la Tour Private Reserve 2019 from Napa. Pretty iconic uh, Napa Cabernet Sauvignon. I haven't had this vintage, I've had previous vintages. Uh, I would like to see publications kind of go out of limb and maybe not put Napa Cabs or Portos as number one. So tell me, what do you think about James Suckling? Do you read his reviews? What do you think of his scores? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks a lot. I'll see you soon.